Hello. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Um, maybe we can start with a quick round of introductions and what you guys are working on, starting with Jana. Good morning. My name is Jana. I work at the Rari Foundation. So we work on behalf of Rari DAO, which is comprised of Rari token holders that get to vote on the future of Rarible protocol, which is essentially the back end of Rarible NFT marketplace, but it's also a protocol that powers community marketplaces, branding marketplaces, wallet integrations, data analytics, and other use cases. And then we also recently launched our own chain, which is NL3 on top of Arbitrum 1. It's called Rari Chain, and it embeds royalties on a node level. So that's essentially uh, the organization that I represent today, and my role is head of strategy. So I have a really fun position because I I get to think of ideas and then make them happen. Hey folks, I'm Shane, uh, I'm the founder of Stargaze. Uh, Stargaze is a sovereign blockchain uh, for NFTs and more. Uh, it has an NFT launchpad and a marketplace and a uh, bunch of other apps on it. Um, it is the home of bad kids, if you guys have heard of that, and uh, recently also Celestine Slots was also minted on it. Um, hi guys, I'm, uh, I'm Bernie, also known as Headmaster Bernie. Um, I'm the creator of Pixel Wizards, uh, which is a collection on Stargaze. Um, done really well so far and uh, yeah, I really try to bring back fun to the NFTs themselves by making interactive animated SVGs, um, which have been really fun so far and uh, I used a lot of creator tooling and always brings ideas uh, towards uh, either the Stargaze team or uh, to some other places. And uh, yeah, it's been fun so far. Great. Um, so both Shane and Yana, you guys are using blockchain, like the chain itself as a foundational sort of primitive for tooling rather than a DAP on a layer two. And I'm seeing increasingly more projects moving towards having their own block space uh, as the sort of you know underlying vehicle for creativity. And I'm curious to hear, I, I would bet you'd have different perspectives on this. So I'm curious to hear, why you think the chain is the right level of abstraction rather than a DAP on, a, on a, another layer, for example? Well, for us, it was a bit of a reaction to what market was going through about a year ago. So last summer, you saw OpenSea slashing royalties, and there was just like this whole movement that was already, you know, happening for a while, right? Like you had the Buller marketplace, which is all about, you know, trading, not necessarily about the creator. And I think it's like, you know, mainly because the market was so bad, right? And then, you know, NFT marketplaces were trying to like incentivize trading and then cutting the royalties was a way to make it cheaper to transact. But, you know, unfortunately it was a creator, not, you know, the marketplace or anybody else that was, you know, then suffering this cut. And it did, that just like didn't sit right with us. And we're, we're not Rarible, we're a separate entity, right? Like, but the community is very similar. And where Rarible is start, has started from was always, you know, being on the side of the creator and allowing royalties and enforcing royalties. So it felt like the right kind of extension because the mission of our foundation is to be building decentralized NFT infrastructure. So we came with the idea of like, what if we then create a blockchain where royalties are not a disputable element, right? Where if you have your NFT minted on that chain, then like it doesn't really matter what player will come into the ecosystem and will you know allow for transactions. They will just not be executed if you don't pay royalties. It's as simple as that. It's just a sequencer level um, enforcement. Um, so it was more of a you know like we want to be there and we want to be there for the creators and we want to make sure that, that they have a place where they can feel respected for what they do, that they can feel safe, and that they're earnings and the effort that they put into like the strategies of like making livelihood in web free is actually respected. So that was like the primarily reason why we launched our own chain. And then of course it's also good for the ecosystem, right? So, like you can verticalize your offering. We have the protocol that's of course integrated with the chain. So if you want to build your NFT marketplace or do any kind of like NFT, you know, application that has to do with indexing or transactions, you can just use that to jumpstart your development. But at the same time, like Rarible as a company then can be building custom marketplaces. They've done it for like Mattel and they've done it for like Animoca brands and they do it for like different players in the web two and web three space. That can also then be built on top of the chain, on top of the protocol, right? So you're just like verticalizing your offering as well. Plus like it's a good home for creators. 
Um, yeah, there's uh, actually a lot of similar reasons why uh, Stargaze kind of started. Um, in, uh, in, in 2021, uh, a lot of the NFT volume was happening on OpenSea. Uh, and at that time, Ethereum was very congested. The gas fees were very high. Um, so we wanted to kind of create a place where people can come and trade with very low gas, uh, where creators, uh, you know, didn't have to, um, uh, you know, have to find it like a developer to try and uh, like launch a collection and all this kind of stuff. So we just wanted to create like a, a simpler kind of easier experience for them. And also, uh, you know, not put the burden on their fans to like pay all these gas fees for trading and stuff like that. Um, another thing is that um, uh, um, we can, um, as an app chain, you can enforce royalties on chain. Uh, so that's something that creators also liked uh, because, uh, you know, soon after that, you saw like royalties go to zero and a bunch of other marketplaces. Um, yeah. Cool, and maybe Bernie, um, sort of from the, we heard like the, you know, infrastructure standpoint, I guess, from a creator standpoint, um, there's a plethora of options for you and for anyone now to do things that weren't there like four years ago, uh, or even two years ago, like four years ago, if you wanted to create NFT, you had to go to the OpenSea shared storefront and deploy it, you know, just put an image up, um, add the title, and that, that was like the range of your optionality. Now you have 100 platforms across like 100 different chains, all with their own sort of perspective and viewpoint. What do you think is important um, for, a cre for sort of the, the creator? You know, what, what, what would you value the most in terms of the options you have? Yeah, I think for, for creators, it's, it's really important to, um, to, to uh, be, in, be in, a, uh, in a good community where you feel welcome and where you um, feel like this is going to be the place where I can launch my collection. Um, because people like it, um, you you got an affinity with the with the with the creators or the founders of the platform you're you're using on, and um, like OpenSea doesn't have that, uh, which is basically just you put it up there and hope it will do well, uh, or you have to build your own uh, very large community up front and then mint it, um, and then also um, the ease of use to um, to mint your collection, um, like. Um, uh, I do have a technical background, so I, I could could have worked my way through deploying contracts or doing things on CLI, CLI um, to deploy a collection. Um, but uh, at Stargaze, I, I mainly chose Stargaze because back then, two years ago, they they had uh, Stargaze Studio uh, already, uh, which which just allows you to upload your collection and then um, deploy it and have the minter and all the things. Uh, ready at your disposal. Um, so I think that's, that's really nice to, uh, to have a launch pad, to, uh, to have a way uh, to communicate with your community, but also to have um, those enforced royalties, um, which basically are, are a source of income, but also um, uh, as some sort of revenue stream that I put back into my collections and try to build more things around them um, so people can enjoy the NFT even more. Great. So, so it sounds to me like, aside from the technical, you know, uh, affordances you get when you have bespoke block space, such as being able to enforce royalties in the level you can after the open sea blur wars, uh, there's also this notion of a community being more sticky when it has its own sort of sovereign, um, I guess, block space that people are more likely to call less around. I guess is that is that right? Do you guys feel the same way that like by having your own chain, it's more likely to get something sticky, whereas in another layer, things maybe pollute in a way where there's more noise than there's signal. Um, uh, yeah, like you can think of an app chain as like a community computer, right? Uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, there's some people who use that term for app chains. And, uh, you know, it's a place where you can be like a bigger fish in kind of a smaller pond. And uh, the community is a bit tighter because, uh, because it's smaller, right? Um, in a place like OpenSea, uh, uh, some of the marketplaces on like Ethereum, it's just, it's, it's, it's just like it's so easy to get lost in the noise. Right, and it's very hard for creators to kind of stand out and get featured, right? So, uh, so sometimes uh, some of the smaller ecosystems are better. Yeah, those are it's like the artists and also the apps, right, <clears throat> and the partners of the ecosystem. It's just like you can create like a curated experience, and you can like it can be idea driven, it can be narrative driven, right? Like it can be like a place for a certain type of creator as well. Whereas, you know, to your point, like those bigger players, it's a bit of a catch-all and 
you know, then it kind of like depends on your motivation of like why you're a creator in the space, right? Like, you know, and what you are trying to do with your NFTs and, and your content. So, you know, you just like go and pick whatever fits you and like your interest the best and, and also like where you feel like you're getting the right kind of attention and the kind of representation. Okay, uh, you want uh, yeah, yeah I, I just want to say like like um, I'm, I'm definitely uh, agreeing on a point with the, with the creation part like um, it really helps as a creator to um, to get the feeling that that your collection can be the next blue chip or that it can be um, uh, something more than just another collection and um, like Astargas have their featured program um, maybe rareable as a, as a curated program as well. Um, which which really helps creators to go for the limits and yeah really express their art. And I think that's that's um, an underrated feature um, and there goes a lot of effort in it to do it right. Um, what does curation mean exactly for you guys? Does it mean the sort of the the ability and the skill to you know tastefully pick a range of things that people would like, or is it something more than that? I'm just curious to see how you define it because it's a very it's a very vague term in some ways. So we, we went to market with a campaign called 10 by Rari and it was a highly curated community or like a collective of creators, but it wasn't all just cherry picked by us. They were actually selected by the community as well. So we, we worked with Hug, which is an online platform community where artists can submit their art and the community uploads them. And then we also worked with curators that specialize in web free, but they also have like arts background from like their previous careers. And the brief was really having an eclectic group of creators so that we are diverse, we represent, but we also showcase the breadth of creativity that can be done on chain, right? So we don't necessarily think that BFPs are the future of NFTs, right? And, and when we are thinking about Rari Chain, we also think about a chain that is filled with NFTs that actually have value. Um, so it's not necessarily just, you know, quick, let's mint 10,000 of like iterations and then just establish some sort of floor price. There actually should be some sort of like thought behind the piece and, you know, just making sure that, you know, it's not super transactional. So that was the thought behind the initial creation. Now, we can't be curating the content on the chain, right? It's permissionless. Anybody can come, anybody can drop their collection. It's, you know, we want to open the door to as many people as possible, of course. So it's more about just setting the tone and then I feel like a lot of the creators will self-select, right? So just like leading by example essentially is the creation and the, the, the kind of creators and the kind of content that you choose to highlight and alleviate, elevate. So the interesting thing is that when you make creator tooling simpler and easier, uh, curation becomes more, more, more important, right? Because uh, then you get to the point where just anyone can go and upload anything, right? So then uh, you, you, you have this like filtering problem, right? And just as Yana said, yeah, I mean, the blockchain is open and permissionless and anyone can go and upload anything. Uh, but then, uh, you, you know, you have to kind of curate on the website side of things. Um, and if you don't, it's going to be a pretty ugly place. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, at, at Stargaze, we basically have two levels of curation. We have a community vote where people um, stake uh, their uh, tokens and vote. Uh, and then there's also the the team. There's like a, a little curation team that also uh, also exists. But um, in the future, we definitely kind of want to open it up to um, other teams that want to self curate and kind of host their own platforms as well. Right. Um, so you know, over the last like two years, we saw this very bizarre situation where. The notion of an NFT went from a nerdy little niche sort of interest to people to being everywhere for like a second <laughs> and then being nowhere for a year or so. Um, you know, the volumes are down, like it used to be able to mint anything and everyone would buy it and then would like 20x in a day and obviously that's not sustainable, so that stopped happening. Um, so now we're in a place where we're back, I think, to the roots in a way, we're trying to rediscover uh, what's possible with these things, where the sustainability comes from, what kind of industry or sort of you know, communities can be built around them. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear, because I think, you know, all of you have been through the trials of the bear and the sort of, you know, 
uh, picks of the bull in a way. Um, and what what have the learnings been um, from that insanity that happened? And how can we move forward in a way that feels much more stable? Because right now, like I, the word NFT is like a slur for a lot of people outside of the space, especially. Uh, I think there's good reasons for that in some ways, right? I don't think we handled it very well for for a while. So I'm just curious to hear how you approach the future with with the awareness that you know things went a bit sideways um, in some respects. Sorry for putting you on the spot on that. Um, well, the way things work in crypto, it seems that whenever something new comes out, there's this like hype phase, uh, and then uh, it kind of dies down a little bit, but never still completely dies. I mean, NFTs are still doing crazy amounts of volume on Bitcoin, Ethereum, right, uh, and other chains. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars of volume, right? So, so when people say NFTs are dead, like they're not. It's still a pretty good business, um, and and artists are still making money and connecting with their fans and stuff like that. Um, in terms of the terminology, I think the term NFT to me seems it feels a lot like the word MP3, right? Where it, it just eventually went away and just became a song, right? So no one talks about, hey, go listen to this MP3 on Spotify, right? It's just a song, right? So at some point in the future. Um, all digital assets will be on chain, right? So it's just another piece of art or a piece of asset. It, 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 yeah, it's not. I think the term will eventually kind of blend or or merge with something else and just become a piece of art at some point. Yeah, it's funny, right? Because like we're using a description of technology as like the description or the label for the actual content and they're they're not the same right so if you think about nft being the underlying technology behind like enabling us to have um, digital assets on blockchain right you can also think about nfts as just like that little simple mechanism that enables in-game trading right it's also the mechanism that like will enable real world assets at the stations right it will be the application already now is broader than what people associate with NFTs based on where we were two years ago. So the more we like can decouple like NFT, right, as a way of describing actual like, for example, art on chain, I think the better, right? Because it's just not apples to apples. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I think the, the uh, I agree with the point that the word NFT is, is, is used a lot. Um, but it's it's nice to see, um, like from a creator's pr perspective, that that I'm I'm always talking about my my collections, like oh, they're the wizards or the witches or uh, whatever, and uh, I see um, I see these these as the um, like the asset that, that it is, and um, yeah, it's just just nice to to uh, follow along with with the community and uh, stuff like that. Um, so so on that sort of point of like the you know, the the sort of content is expanding beyond just, you know, technology. like it's not just like a thing that you buy, there can, there can be other, any kind of digital ass can be, can be that. So let's talk about the wider thing. Um, are there any distribution mechanisms, which is to say like ways of these things moving and transferring and being created and being sort of disposed of that you find interesting above and beyond just like someone put something up for a price and people come and buy it? So what kind of, like, you know, talking about sort of progressive methods of distribution, maybe free things, things that are, you only get if you've done something, things that are sort of more gamified in a way, experience that are more performative rather than just like uh, financial, explicitly financial direct from the get-go. Is this something that excites you guys and you're working on? Yeah, I, I think if you look at the recent launch of Mad Scientist on Osmosis, um, they did it to StreamSwap, which was a, a new way of, um, trying to find uh, price discovery for for the assets, like they basically launched a lab token, um, and you had to get ten lab to mint at least one uh, mad scientist NFT. Um, so I think it was a really nice way, um, uh, and especially for the first time to um, to uh, yeah find price discovery for uh, the mint price of your of your NFT. So I think that's um, I, that. It's it's yeah it's it's not exactly a gamified way but um, it's it's more like an, a decentralized way of of trying to find 
the, the right price, um, which eventually led to uh, mad scientists being very hypey and um, yeah, continue onwards uh, to be uh, a great project. Um, yeah, and I, I love to see more more of these kind of things in the future. In terms of distribution, I think uh, like the slots are a great example, right? Uh, a collection like that, um, they're, uh, um, and even bad kids, they're starting to get airdrops and stuff like that, right? Um, there's there's Twitter spaces all the time. There's talk of like launching, um, you know, lazy chain, slot chain, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, NFT collections are just, well, PFPs especially are like crypto native groups, right? Uh, and we're still in the early days of kind of exploring what the end game is there, right? Uh, but, 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 but it's really good to like have an, uh, it, it, the PFPs are really great for having a, an entire narrative, like having something they can rally around, right? So like all the modular folks can rally around, uh, like the slots or something like that, right? Um, and I, and, and, and I think we'll, we'll start seeing that for kind of, every, for lack of a better word, for, la for like every narrative in, in kind of crypto, but then eventually beyond crypto as well. Yeah, I think like you touched on the topic of community, right? Like you can, I think like there, there's a big value in belonging to a community through, uh, you know, the, the culture that surrounds a particular collection, right? Or a particular, you know, artist. And when we are thinking about like NFTs, a lot of the times the discussion is also around value, right? Like, is there any value in holding this NFT, right? Does it provide me some sort of access, right? So like, if you're part of a community with an artist, like maybe that ownership of that NFT does give you a whitelist for a future drop, or maybe it does, you know, provide you with like some sort of special perk or special content at some point, you know, throughout your uh, participation in the community. We just, you know, we were sponsoring the Shifai Summit on Sunday, one day before EFCC kicked off, and we provided the community with a mint of an NFT, which actually then the holder of that NFT is entitled to a discount if they want to enroll into the next cohort of Shifai, right? Some sort of like perk that comes from ownership, I think it's also something, you know, that people are looking at and, you know, artists have actually, like the, the really savvy ones have actually been working with for quite some time. Uh, Shane mentioned sort of the notion of uh, NFTs as cultural uh, currency for crypto native communities. Um, I'm curious to hear what you think about. I see. I, I think there's like two different approaches to the future of this, um, and I've seen them. People change their minds about which one's best, and it tends to follow the general narratives of, of the market. One of them is, you know, let's try to go out there and get normal people to you know, use these things in a way that makes sense for them, whatever they want to do. So there was like a bunch of um, approaches towards like getting you know, Starbucks onboarded or Spotify selling and NFTs of things that, you know, of songs there. That didn't work out so well. I'm, maybe it will, maybe like, you know, sort of trying to find out what people care about outside of crypto and trying to see if the technology can somehow augment the demand or the problems for that. That could be one route to growing the ecosystem. The other one is kind of doubling down and saying we don't really care about that right now. Let's see what, you know, this weird community of crypto native people and their sort of tribes and their, you know, aesthetic intentions and their financial um, dispositions, this is the thing that we should try and cater for. Do you think that these are mutually exclusive? And if they are, do you think that one is, you know, clearly better than the other one? Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it's never good to kind of force things on on people, right? Uh, I, I think people have to like organically discover stuff. Um, and also we're just, I still think we're way too early to do like real world things with big brands and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I think it has to be more of a grassroots kind of bottom up type movement. Um, I think I think when, uh, um, you know, people see what uh, people in these NFT communities are doing and, and the things that are building and stuff like that, then other people will want to get involved and their friends will want to get involved. And I think, I think that's uh, like this kind of slower growth. I think that's a bit more healthy. Um, yeah, you know, we've seen various projects try things with big brands and none of them has really worked out. Uh, and, and it just makes it a bit more cringe, right? And, and that's the last thing that we want. <laughs> 
Yeah, and also a lot of times like this big brand collaboration, like so you, you do it and then what, right? It's like like how much of it goes beyond that initial mint, right? How much of it actually has longevity and creates that culture around it? I think it's also really, really difficult to, to get those onboarded because there's um, there's a, a deep level of, of, of uh, technical stuff happening and um, still uh, working in the background um, that, that we're still not um, not in a way to abstract it away uh, for the end users, which they basically just want to buy an image or something. And if you're going to do it to a Stripe checkout or something, then then those kind of things will make it really easier um, uh, to to also get your get your own NFT uh, or um, and I and I do at some point also think like the word NFT has some. Yeah, some 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 bad noise to it, like uh, people making money, rugs, losing money, um, those kind of things. So um, I think we we also somehow need to move away from the word NFT, but more move towards like uh, collection names or uh, digital asset, and uh, yeah, something that that an end user or a normal Web two user wants to own. Uh, and I think um, yeah, trying to find ways to bring those type of people, make those type of people interested in uh, getting these, um, like uh, collectibles, um, because every, most all, all, almost all people like to collect things. Um, like, and if you want to collect digital things, then it should be made as easy as possible and fit to your um, personal uh, preferences. Um. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, another thing is just you can also just like double down on the word NFT and be like proud of it, right? <laughs> um, I, I, I haven't really figured out what, uh, which, which, which approach to take yet. <laughs> um, most of the things we've seen do well or be exciting for people seem to be visual, uh, particularly things that are uniquely visual, which I think is probably a human disposition. You want like the thing that's yours and no one else has and you can look at it maybe late at night and be happy that you have it uh, and no one else has it. Um, I'm curious to hear if you think that there's other media that are uh, ripe to digital collectability. Um, so one of, them, one of the things is probably music. And Laura was talking earlier about the sort of difficulties there, um, both technical and cultural and also financial and legal and all that stuff. Uh, it hasn't really taken off. That was the thing I was the most excited about. Uh, initially, it was like collecting music in a way that the vinyl did for the physical world. Having the digital equivalent of that seemed to me to make sense to most people, like wanting to sort of, you know, or tickets were a thing for a while, right? You went somewhere, pop ups uh, for, for events. Um, but it se still seems to me like the, the visual thing, your, your, you know, particular cute animal with a weird hat, or um, your generative art collection that, you know, sort of looks kind of nice and interesting, uh, se seems to be the thing that people gravitate towards the most. Um, do you feel the same way, or do you think that like there's still a shot at making um, more diverse media be collectible? Yeah, we're like we're always trying to like look beyond that visual version of that NFT, right? Like you mentioned music, so you know one thing, and it's not fully cracked, but like we're talking to a bunch of partners about like. The, the royalty piece and music, right? That's like essentially also the promise of NFT, right? Like why don't you use NFT as an underlying technology for licensing your tracks, right? Like for example, you have uh, the visual piece, which is a video. Why wouldn't you be able to license music for that video that is a digital piece, right? Digital asset and NFT itself from another NFT. Right? I think like we're like almost there. We just like need to like properly package it as a product, right? And do some sort of good UX on it, which is always a hurdle. Um, but like there are ways of like just layering NFTs on top of like NFTs, right? So you have like a richer experience from like the assets, the digital asset that you are like owning or collecting, right? And then of course you have like other applications of like that NFT technology that goes like beyond actual art. But I think like just having NFTs within NFTs is something that, you know, I would just love to see more of. Yeah, I totally agree with Yana there. I think um, um, music is a huge use case here. It just hasn't happened yet. I think it will happen in the future uh, because uh, just everything about the format of NFTs for music is just, uh, is just better, right? You can have, uh, is 
uh, programmable, right? Uh, you can integrate um, uh, something visual, uh, something audio, everything, you know, everything in between. Uh, program royalties, um, you know, make sure everyone gets paid. I think I think it's really perfect for that. Uh, but just how like Spotify, di you know, disrupted the industry. I think something like that will happen. Uh, it's just uh, we're, we're, we're you know we're still in the early days of this stuff. But I, I I do believe something like that will happen. It's just that you know we're working against these institutions that have like like publishers and record labels that have have been around for a long time. Right, so uh, just kind of working against that is, is a bit difficult. Yeah, or, or working with them, which or takes them, yeah. even longer. <laughs> and, I, and I think also like, um, like seeing music and videos um, being uh, turned into NFTs, um, like uh, I see it as, as the next thing, but you can also uh, pull it towards books, but even HTML files um, or even Twitter posts, uh, uh, those kind of things. Like that, you can tokenize everything um, just to verify the truth behind it. Like um, what you see with AI coming up a lot. Um, like verify: uh, is it AI? Is it a deep fake? Is it the, the real video, or uh, is it the real post? Is it the real message? Um, so I, I think it, it, it will come really far, but it got to take a while to, to adapt. Um, yeah. Um, do you feel like each of your chains has a different identity? Like, do you, what does it feel like? What does the right chain feel like? I want to start. Like, what's the sort of, because we were saying earlier, right? Like, all these things have, we spoke block spaces have also bespoke identities in some way. We spoke brands and maybe they attract different kinds of people. How would you describe like Rari Chain as a as an entity so, or as a brand? So we, we are creator first, but we also look at creator in more of a broader definition, right? Like the moment you want to create something that is that can be labeled as digital asset, for us you are a creator. You don't have to be creative in the traditional sense of things, right? So you don't have to be publishing a piece of music, you don't have to do a photograph, you don't have to do digital art. Like it's fine if you're creation is a newsletter, right? And you just like want to mint that as an NFT. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, this accessible creator economy, that's essentially like what we stand for. Um, and then also like experimentation and innovation, like we really want to be uh, helping projects, teams, individuals that want to be doing something new and experimental in the space. And, you know, we really just, you know, welcome them to come to us and talk to our grand team and you know our builders in the space as well and figuring out like how we can make it happen because that was like the the second big thing we wanted to do with this chain we wanted to house a lot of experimentation and innovation and really be that uh, a sandbox for playing because just as you were talking Shane about like the the costs on mainnet being high right the Rari chain is an L3 it means it's like even cheaper than L2s Right, like if you're not doing things in scale, that probably doesn't really matter that much. But if you are trying to do something in scale, right, like generative art or you know even like storing like big chunks of like data on 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 chain, like that cost does add up. So we just really want to help be as accessible as possible so that experimentation can take place. Yeah, I think right now, uh, just because uh, crypto is still a, a bit niche, um, a lot of people kind of revolve around uh, uh, kind of uh, the chains themselves. When uh, I, I, I think a creator should may, pr be a bit more focused on like, you know, directly connecting with their fans, uh, um, like despite what kind of platform that they're on. Uh, so, you know, we just want to provide like the best tooling for that, for them to be able to do that, right? Uh, and, and, and also like off-chain tooling, right? Connecting uh, on social media platforms, on Discord, uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, like bots and stuff like that for them. I, I don't know if you have more to add to that, Bernie. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> um, you mentioned creator funding, I think. Uh, in the real world, you know, with music industry, for example, or even sort of other kinds of IP, uh, usually some sort of entity finds and makes a bet on someone smaller and who's not that big, and then with that funding and with a sort of attention, then they can sort of compete in the marketplace of uh, ideas and content uh, in a way where there's more, so they have more ammunition in their sort of 
you know, that's how like things work generally. And that's how financial things work. You have someone who's willing to make a bet early on and fund that, and that someone has to be someone who can make many, many bets, right? Uh, in the crypto art space and NFT space, we didn't see that happening a lot, at least for a while. You kind of had like fights for yourself on the Twitter noise, and maybe that's a bit difficult for someone who's not popular, right? Otherwise, the famous people get more famous, and those who are not famous enough can never really get that escape velocity to, you know, um, actually create a brand and an IP that's that's substantial. So, uh, I personally think that protocols have a responsibility towards creating, uh, you know, funding um, options and sort of. Uh, promotional options for early stage creators, right? And whatever that means is up to the protocol. But I feel like the equivalent of NGOs or museums or, well, not museums really, but sort of galleries and labels in the real world, the same kind of public goods funding. Um, well, that's not public goods funding, but public goods funding in the real world has an analogy with protocol funding in crypto world. How, how do you guys think about that? So it's it's for us it's our community that gets this that gets to decide because the protocol and the chain is governed by a DAO. So in our DAO we have delegates and community members that actually do come up with initiatives around how to lift up artists of you know different backgrounds and different geographies. So right now there's actually I think maybe the the voting period already uh, closed, but there's a proposal that passed which is all about. Uh, uplifting creators in South America and you know cultivating more of a you know following for our ecosystem in that region right so it's always like in benefit of the DAO but what the program does is like it provides platform for underrepresented underrepresented artists in South America right so it's it's our community gets to come up with the ideas and then decide whether these ideas will um, see the light of the day or not, and you know it's a little bit more organic, and there's less on the foundation side when we are saying you know that's how we want to be growing the community of the artists. It's really much more like our community spearheads that. Yeah, um, it, it's always easier when an artist already has a community, uh, um, but but if they don't. Um, uh, they can kind of like bounce off the Stargaze community, right? There are people that are um, uh, would would go mint like every new collection or something like that that launches on Stargaze, uh, and and so they can kind of like start um, at a certain level, right? And we also have uh, Stargaze is also kind of governed by uh, uh, like a DAO, and uh, we have uh, uh, like a community DAO that also like gives grants to certain artists. And um, we also have a, um, a like a featured artist spot uh, every Friday, and we tend to like feature like an artist that uh, you know, is kind of like up and coming, uh, just to kind of give them put them in the spotlight for a little bit. I, I also think like I I, I didn't get any funding before uh, uh, before launching my collection. Uh, yeah, I did get funded my my launchpad. Uh, uh, um, Launchpad uh, fees, uh, which which was really nice uh, to begin with, um, but I had to build through the bets of the bear market and uh, build my community around it and launch, um, yeah, l launch purely based on my effort. And when I always talk to creators um, that want to launch a collection, um, always be again yourself. Always try to bring something new to the table um, and and have people excited for for your collection and don't just drop it and hope it will do well because it w most of the times it won't just do your best effort and try to reach out to many community members and projects uh, yeah to make your to make yourself known and i think that really helps yeah, I think that's super important, right? Like the campaigning for yourself and like be your own marketing in engine. It's like so important. Now the community that exists in an ecosystem is obviously like a good leg up, but it's like your success to make, right? It's it's incredibly important. And I think like apart from grants and funding, I think what's also cool is to look at additional ways of providing creators with income streams and revenue streams, right? So like one thing that we're actually workshopping now with our community is, can we launch some sort of incentive program? Can we do some sort of like ecosystem incentive alignment, right? That brings more revenue to the creator. Like, you know, look at what Zora is doing, right? Like, you know, minting fees back to the creators, right? So there's more than just the 
uh, funding in terms of a grant, but you know, there's just you know, so much that can be done for creators to put them in a better position of earning as well. Great. Uh, I think we're almost out of time. Um, really appreciate everyone's opinions and thoughts and insights and ideas. Any closing thoughts from anyone? It's the worst question to ask usually. But well, I think it's just like being a creator is always tough. Right? It was stuff before Web3, and then Web3 came, and it came with a promise of like, now you can actually make more money. And I think for a while it was true, but now it's again like entering that spot when it's maybe like tough. Um, so I think like, you know, persevere and, you know, be smart about the way you, you navigate crypto because, you know, to my previous point, there's multiple ways to make money there. So, you know, just take advantage of that. Yeah, I mean, if you're a creator and you're curious, you know, just get started. You don't have to launch a whole PFE collection or something. You can just do an open edition. You can just launch one thing and just get your feet wet and see how that works out. Yeah, and I think it's nice, like, if, you, if you're if you a creator and you're wondering if, if you should launch your collection or whatsoever, um, you can always uh, come see me after the talk and um, I can, yeah, point you in the right direction. Great. Thank you guys so much. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you.